At the Sports History Network, we're proud to introduce you to a new sponsor for our podcasts. It's Home Field Apparel, your premium collegiate apparel brand right out of Indianapolis. They've got incredibly comfortable t-shirts, plus they're officially licensed with vintage college designs. They have over 150 plus colleges available now and always adding more. Homefield digs through the archives and history of your school to find unique logos, mascots, and moments to make thoughtful designs for your school. When you shop today, New customers can get a 15% discount off their first purchase using the promo code SPORTSHISTORY at checkout. You can learn more at homefieldapparel.com. What does it mean for a new franchise to record their first victory? And what does it really mean if it takes beyond the first season to find that first victory? Well, we had that case come up in a game during 1977 where one team heard... The roar of the crowd. We remember those instances of great sports moments by the gifted participants at just the right moment in time. This is a presentation from which those great moments in sports history are revived. Come listen to the roar of the crowd presented by Apex Sports. Hello, my friends of sports history. This is Darren Hayes of the Pigskin Dispatch and Sports Jersey Dispatch Podcast, the Pig Pen Sports Affiliates, to bring you one of the great shows that we've come up with, The Roars of the Crowd. Hope you've been enjoying this series uh, where we talk about each day uh, an event that happened where crowds were cheering and just uh, celebrating some great athletic accomplishment. And we have one of those again today. And we're titling this one sort of the Norseman Raid. Before we get into the story, just want to make sure that you are aware that we have a Twitter account. We are at Pigskin Dispatch. Uh, and you can follow us on Twitter, find out what's going on, what's on our mind, what we're following, what we're liking, what we're re-quoting, and uh, who, who we're associating with, and some great little tidbits, especially during football season with these games coming out and uh, things that are happening. A lot of commentary going back and forth with us and some of the other folks that we, we follow. So very enjoyable, at Pigskin Dispatch. You know, also Facebook, we have the at Pigskin Dispatch, but we have the Pigskin Dispatch Facebook page where you can follow what's going on there. Now let's get into our story. Now there was a rare early season Saturday night game in the NFL back on September 24th, 1977. Pretty odd indeed for a Saturday night game. The Minnesota Vikings, then coached by Bud Grant, traveled to the Sunshine State to pay a visit to a rather new team in the NFL, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. The Buccaneers, they were in their second year of existence, and they really weren't a very good team. A year prior to that, in their debut, the, the Cream Sickles, as they were called, because of their oddly colored orange uniforms that they wore at the time, uh, they sort of melted under the heat of the other NFL teams, with them finishing 0-16 in their inaugural season. Uh, if you remember right, that 1976 season it brought into the NFL not only the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, but the Seattle Seahawks as well as they they both came into the league that year. Their opponents, the Minnesota Vikings, were on the other side of the spectrum. They were one of the top national football conference teams, uh, a place they had been for much of the 1970s under the leadership of Bud Grant and their great legendary quarterback, Fran Tarkington. And don't forget about the Purple People Eaters defense that they had, some great players there as well. However, they, uh, the Vikings, entered this game with an 0-1 record after losing in Week 1 to the Dallas Cowboys uh, 16-10 to in the opening week of play of National Football League. Now, this was the only game being played of the Saturday night special. Uh, so a national audience got to watch the Buccaneers, many for the first time. Now, Tampa did not disappoint as they played extremely well, especially on defense, holding a 3-2 lead at the half. 
That sounds a little bit more like a baseball score than a contest in the NFL. But the points were a product of a defensive back, Jarris White of the Buccaneers, picking off uh, Minnesota's pass from Fran Tarkington near midfield. And, you know, they got themselves in position to kick a field goal, uh, taking a 3 nothing lead. Just a little bit more, longer later after that, uh, Minnesota ended up scoring their points on a safety, thus that 3-2 to two score. Now, things at halftime had to be going through a lot of people's minds. You know, could Minnesota lose this game to a team that had never won an NFL game ever? The Vikings, after all, were the defending NFC champions. Uh, they represented the, their conference in the Super Bowl, losing to the Steelers in a very good game of Super Bowl IX. Surely they could not lose to the worst team in the league. Well, the Vikings offense that had been stymied much of the contest finally seemed to get their legs under them and get a little bit of rhythm in the third quarter. The frustrated players in purple were finally seeing veteran quarterback Fran Tarkington and company move the ball. It was a drive that everyone had expected to come and that they had waited with with bated breath. Tarkington had engineered this drive on three key plays that put Minnesota in business. The 37-year-old signal caller scrambled and somehow was able to launch a strike to wide out Sammy White for a nice big gain, getting a first down, moving the sticks. Next, a few plays later, was an eight-yard toss to running back Sam Johnson to, to move those chains again and keep a drive alive. A third was the capper of the drive when Tarkington found his star halfback Chuck Foreman wide open and the big back hauled in the pass to complete a 31-yard scoring strike that put the Vikings up for the first time in a game. And the Vikings in the stadium and everywhere through their TV sets had a sense of relief as Foreman scored and he heard that roar of the crowd that was going across the country. And maybe a, a few uh, Tums and Pepto-Bismols were being taken at that time too, alleviating some of that pain. Now the defenses on both sides would allow not another point to go on the scoreboard. And Minnesota ended up hanging on and winning that game by the final score of 9-3. to Now Tampa in postscript would finally win their first game in week 13, disposing of the New Orleans Saints 33-14. to Now they went, you know, think about that. It was 14 game seasons back there. Uh, they lost uh, all of their, their games the year before. Uh, the 14 lost the first two of the this new season to so 0 and 16, and uh, you know and then but that so they won in week 13 and then they won the 14th week of the season as well in the season finale over the St. Louis Cardinals 17 to 7 to for John McKay's team to finish strong at the end, but they still had a 2 and 12 record on that second year 1977. The Vikings, well, after starting out 5-3, and three, went on to win the NFC Central Division only by a tiebreaker over the Chicago Bears as both teams had identical 9-5 and five records at the end. The Vikes then defeated the LA Rams in a divisional round of the playoffs in a game called the Mud Bowl. Uh, we have some things on that on Pigskin Dispatch you can find. Uh, before falling in the NFC Championship game to the Dallas Cowboys 23-6. Had Foreman and Tarkin to not hooked up for that score in the third quarter to win that game and hear those crowds cheer. The Vikings may have well lost to Tampa Bay and probably would have missed the playoffs altogether. So we celebrate that moment when Chuck Foreman crossed the goal line and heard the roar of the crowd. Thank you for joining us here for this little bit of football history. But we like to talk about sports each and every day. Make sure you follow us, pigskindispatch.com, jerseydispatch.com, and you can always find our podcast as well as 30 others on the sportshistorynetwork.com. Till tomorrow, everybody, have a great sports history day. We're dribbling around and see the shot clock's almost out, so we got to put up our shot and come back tomorrow for some more great sports history. We invite you to check out our websites, jerseydispatch.com and pigskindispatch.com. Not only see the daily sports history, but to experience the preservation of great events and people that play the games. Find us on Pigskin Dispatch. It's also on social media outlets of Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and don't forget the Pigskin Dispatch YouTube channel to get all your daily sports history. Pigskin Dispatch is happy to be associated with the Sports History Network, the sports headquarters of yesteryear, found at sportshistorynetwork.com. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com.
Pittsburgh Guardian newspaper circa 1924. But for Marla Delft, assistant editor, everything was about to change. For she was about to discover the awesome attractiveness of Row 1 brand retro sports paraphernalia items, thanks to Orville Mulligan, sports writer. And there it is. Wow, Orville, that's really the bee's knees. Isn't it just? A poster-sized replica of the actual 1909 World Series program cover. I can see that. But where did you get it? And where'd you get it framed? I ordered it from the Row 1 website, where over 6,000 items of sports memorabilia from the 1880s to the 1990s are available for reproduction in multiple sizes and in several different materials, with over a dozen styles of frame to choose from for prints like this. Well, I'm sure Mr. Delft would love to put up more of these in the office. But I'm equally as sure they're beyond this newspaper's budget. <laughs> Not at all, my dear Marla. See for yourself. Go to sportshistorynetwork.com slash row one. Sportshistorynetwork.com slash row one. Oh my, these are good prices. Oh, and look at this stuff. Oklahoma, Nebraska football. College basketball art. Michael Jordan items. And so Retro it was that Marla Delft discovered the spondiferous magic of Row 1 sports memorabilia arts and prints. You can, too, by visiting sportshistorynetwork.com slash row1. That's R-O-W number one today for access to the full Row 1 catalog of gallery prints and gifts like t-shirts, long sleeve shirts, telephone cases, coffee mugs, blankets, pillows, towels, and even shower curtains. Act A for a 15% discount off all prints with coupon code SHN15 and 20% off all other items with coupon code SHN20 at checkout. And keep your dial locked to the Sports History Network for the exciting chronicles of the 1920 sports world in Orville Mulligan, sports writer, coming soon. Oh,